trying to get out of that time. <laughs> Thank you very much again. Uh, now we have some time for questions, discussions, opinions that you'd like to test against Solomon's, uh, should I say, categorizations and synthesis, etc. But the best way to do it would be send me an email. <laughs> <laughs> and you respond. <laughs> no, within a week or two. Be careful, they know your email address. <laughs> <coughs> Hi. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I, I feel that I mean, the very core of this... Oh, Mr. Ford. Oh, Mr. Ford. Gabi? Yeah. Uh, I oh. feel uh, that uh, no. your, your heart message from your veranda no, is uh, the uh, insistence on the uh, distinction between uh, uh, information and, and, and knowledge. Uh, according to this, and also according to, the, I, I know you, you are interested in the concept of, of this kind of uh, commission. And uh, according to this, can you say something about the, the concept of, of knowledge uh, transmission and knowledge data? What is it? How you define it? And what does it involve? Knowledge building and knowledge, and knowledge transmission. I have a sense that knowledge cannot be transmitted. Why do you use the term knowledge transmission? Uh, I don't. Oh, well, well, let's say yes, I do. But, but that's the common daily usage. Okay, you know, there's the daily usage of term and the scientific usage of term. And sometimes it's the same term, okay, as the word intelligence. You use it in daily life. That was an unintelligent comment you made. Okay, you say about somebody, you don't mean intelligence in the uh, Guilford or Sternberg or Howard Gardner sense. Uh, so here we say knowledge transmission, but when we talk about it more accurately, I'd say knowledge cannot be transmitted, information. If it becomes knowledge, you are the one who turns the information into knowledge. How do you do it? That's a whole secret of learning, of meaningful learning. I cannot in one sentence stated, okay? It is making connections to knowledge you already have. It is elaborating what has just been stated or what appeared on paper. It's a very complex cognitive process, which uh, many, I mean, it's, if you know the literature about uh, co reading comprehension. What is reading comprehension? What is comprehension? Okay? And there are mountains of, of, of literature on it because this little thing, and many people don't comprehend it. Okay? What I want to say is really the move from knowledge, from information to knowledge, is a very complex one. We can point out, as I try to do, the external conditions which may be necessary, okay, but never sufficient. Uh, for this transformation, like tutorship, like community, like face-to-face -face communication, but they don't exhaust the list and they do not describe the cognitive processes in the time world. What about knowledge building then? Knowledge building and knowledge construction for me sounds the same. Uh, knowledge construction <coughs> means, <coughs> building, means <coughs> My interpretation is creating a widening a network of connections between different information elements. And the meaningfulness comes with the network. So if you take a single item, Haifa has 350,000 inhabitants. It doesn't connect to anything. It's a bit of information, not knowledge. But once you begin to connect it to numerous other things, Okay? It's a third largest city, it's a port city, it cannot grow because of Mount Carmel, you name it. Suddenly, this piece of information gradually is built into a piece of knowledge, and that means it begins to be a part of a network. Network of all kinds of connections, causal, correlational, father-son relationships, before-after relationships, etc.
Um, as before, can people hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, as, as, as you said, I was saying yesterday in response to my question, I think we're in very much agreement. We start off on a, and I, and I feel that um, my colleagues, certainly the ones I have day-to-day -day contact with, would, would agree with very much that, that you're saying here. Um, uh, the, and the distinction between uh, information uh, and the information technology uh, and knowledge, that we, I think that there is nowadays a fairly widespread understanding that, that knowledge um, is constructed um, within the individual. It's, it's almost uh, uh, almost trivial, except that it's taken people perhaps uh, too long to, uh, to, to recognize this. Uh, but if that is the case, um, uh, what we're really talking about is the, trans is the transmission of information. Uh, you started today's lecture pointing out, uh, or starting from the book, uh, as a, um, a vehicle for transmitting perhaps knowledge, but information that was knowledge in, in other people's minds. Uh, I, I find it difficult to see uh, what the significant difference is between the book and the electronic means of transmission, except um, what you've already pointed out today, uh, that uh, um, electronic transmission is, is more efficient, cheaper, etc., etc. Uh, it, it seems to me that, uh, that um, uh, what we need to be looking at in um, our questions, to what extent should we use uh, um, electronic transmission in, in higher education, is one um, uh, that has to do with communication between the teacher and, uh, and the taught. Uh, many of us on uh, at, at this uh, conference today are concerned uh, with the training of people who are already professionally competent teachers um, and who have as much to communicate to us, their advisors, as the other way around. Um, uh, and in ways which would, in effect, not be possible, physically possible, um, uh, in ordinary classroom terms. They haven't got time to come to us, it's too expensive for them to come to us. And um, ordinary classrooms are not often not conducive to that degree of individualization. So my, my point is, if, if the, uh, if the trans transition from information to knowledge must necessarily happen um, uh, with the recipient, why is the um, the, the vehicle of transmission um, so important. In other, uh, otherwise, and then you've already pointed out, it's cheaper, faster, etc. Et okay, you, you said a few things. Let me try to keep them in track. First of all, the metaphor from the tall girl. The metaphor I brought up is simply because he saw in his book the steady, heavy, secure, immobile church being threatened by the new innovation called the book. Using it as a metaphor. And if you remember my, my first slide, you have noticed it's lost on many people. Can you see the meaning? There are little boats down there. Will they come out from the wave alive? Or is it the last we have seen of the boats? Okay? So that's a metaphor. So we have two metaphors. The Japanese painting and uh, Victor Hugo with both a question mark. Will the one thing destroy the other? And yes, there is a danger. Okay, that's one point. That's the reason I mentioned the book in the church. The second, though, is you ask a very good question. Namely, if everything depends on the learner to construct knowledge out of the information, what difference does it make what means, through what means 
that the information reached the individual. First of all, it does make a difference. And uh, uh, for 30 years I've studied some of the differences. The, envelopes, the envelope of transmission makes a huge difference in terms of the meaning, the content, etc. of the message itself. So it is not McLuhan to the extreme. The medium is a message, but a little bit softer McLuhan, the medium influences the message. When I say McLuhan, I guess many here below the age of 70 don't even know whom I have in mind. I see a few gray heads saying, yes, yes, we do know. <laughs> okay. McLuhan was the guru, the god of communication in the 60s and did some very interesting scholarly work, none of which stands up to scrutiny, but it's still exciting. But your other point is the following. Oh, okay, that point, let me elaborate. I talked about the conditions, not the structure of the message or the medium, but the conditions under which information can become knowledge. Now, if you told me, as it's been done, that you would transmit the information through the internet, Sorry. And your students would meet once a week for a discussion group. That would be providing an external support facilitator to help them transform the information into knowledge. Okay? And in that case, you might say whether the information reaches them through a book in the library, through the screen, okay, or a lecture, that may not be the important thing. The really important thing is the conditions created for the transformation from information to knowledge. And that may be an example of a good integration okay, between the transmission of information and the construction of knowledge. Okay, then. Because you had breakfast. <laughs> we had it before breakfast or before dinner. Yes, but I think you used the metaphor to say that uh, there are um, um, somehow on campus education is the, like the French restaurant and distance education is like the McDonald's. I never go to McDonald's. So. Uh, I think that uh, on campus education is and distance education is good for different uh, purposes and that uh, on and it's not a matter of quality i think that on campus education is better for the for the basic professional education without any doubt because of uh, what you talk about uh, um, what you call the socialization and the uh, training of skills and that uh, distance education is a very good alternative for uh, further professional education, adult education, um, and also the, the democracy aspect that you mentioned. But then you have to put efforts into um, um, to assure the socialization and the skill uh, aspect. And then the challenge is to to develop um, tools for the cooperation over distance. And that's our challenge. And that's what we, we work to. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm very happy with the things you've said. Because what you really say is you, you echo something I tried to say yesterday that different media or settings serve different purposes. And I fully agree with you. 
Now we may disagree whether campus education is like the French restaurant and, and distance education like a McDonald's or not. All right, probably it depends on a point of view. When you talk of socialization being basic, let's say, and therefore you would need face-to-face -face education. So for socialization purposes, face-to-face uh, -face is the French restaurant, okay? You cannot really socialize from a distance. It's difficult, yes. It would be difficult. I agree. Um, uh, so in this respect, we have no disagreement. Whether uh, you want to have... I had in mind something a little bit different. Namely, if you take courses in economics, the first year of economics, first year of... Okay, even the train of nurses. Maybe in... I hope I'm not making a mistake here. You know, there's a nurse here. Please do. <coughs> here you are. Uh, where you have to teach them the basics of uh, biology, chemistry, physiology, anatomy. Okay? These are basically information issues. Okay? How many years does it? No. Okay? We have one liver, but two ears. Okay? Three eyes and many hair. <laughs> maybe that, if I'm right, and I may be wrong, that for this basic information, uh, indeed, this is certainly could be very good and save money, time, and effort. On the other end, you may say, and you may have a good point there, that it is the initial steps which are really laying the foundations of socialization with proper modeling, and I have no argument with you. I mean, it's really a matter of a point of view. We agree one thing, that there is a differentiation, and there isn't a single answer, okay, saying, you, only this is good, the other one is not. And that's all I get for synthesis. Okay, then we have another comment. Professor, we, we live in the, in the world and the time of... Uh, computerization and um, at the same time uh, pressure for urgency reduction of time in terms of transmitting uh, information um, uh, you used the word knowledge in distinction of information uh, and you also uh, used quite a few times uh, the word wisdom should I, I apologize? No. <laughs> I should uh, point to that, uh, I think, uh, and say it takes time to develop and accumulate wisdom. And uh, in the time of uh, urgency, we need to stress that, I think. That uh, we need time together as people. You have stressed uh, the human factor. We, it takes time to, to develop wisdom together with other people. For instance, at the campus. How much time do you think? Compared to sitting alone in splendid isolation with your computer. Thank you. I'm not sure I have fully fathomed the depth of your wisdom, your question. <laughs> but, uh, what occurs to me as a response is back to the last statement. <coughs> it is true that we are in the age of urgency. It may very well be we are the age of information. We spoke of the language. It's an information age, not a knowledge age. It's an information highway, not a knowledge highway. It may be that we in education should say, wait a minute, we don't have to rush and totally transform, let's say, teacher training or higher education to become distance learning. We want to reap the best of it when it is appropriate, for whom it is appropriate, the stage of development of teachers, when this may be the most appropriate time, and there is something to debate, discuss, and think about. Okay. Um, on the other hand, 
saying we are the age of urgency. And now everything needs to be in half time and quarter time. Over breakfast we mentioned, I mentioned that 1981, I remember I had a modem of 300 baud. And that was fast enough. I didn't need a modem of 54,000. I didn't even know what that was. Now that I have a modem of 54,000, what on earth am I doing with the time that I've saved? <laughs> I have more emails. Okay, my point is, and, and, and I'm not tired of stretching it. We do not have to accept the wave pushed by technocrats, the world of business, etc., that wants us all to go virtual. And let me tell you, there's a history, a short history of it already. Universities in the United States, first, without thinking where they are going, started out. One university, York, in Canada, had a strike. <coughs> All faculty struck. They call it, we are moving from the classroom to the boardroom. We do not want our courses to become virtual courses. The next thing is, you know, they'll be fired. Certain courses for certain students, indeed, the 40-year-old engineer with five children who lives in the mountains and cannot come to campus to study C++ language, for that person, that, that's a wonderful solution. But not for every 18-year-old. So the real issue is to think what is appropriate for whom and where, when and why. Okay, thank you. I have at least three more waiting in line now. Please. Yes, I would like to pose. <coughs> I would like to uh, pose that question. Uh, what uh, education is appropriate when and why? <laughs> Which is this question I, I'm, I'm quite sure you, you're not going to answer because it's a, it's a too, too, too abstract question. But that is what is interesting in the next phase now, having heard your two very inspiring lectures.